Well, we're at nine o'clock and I like to get started, especially on a Saturday, so I can go back and finish packing. So, uh, this is my sixth or seventh time in here in CCEA. I actually got here by accident. But how many people know Sharon? Everybody uh, know who Sharon is? Okay, she's one of the people that puts these things together and she's been doing it for quite a long time. I was actually at a conference the first time I actually did my experience of going out to actually try to share ideals that we were using at our school site, I went to a CAG uh, uh, a, uh, conference, California Association of the Gifted, and I was doing something, it was on math. And I remember coming to my first session and the room was, was about the same amount of people in here right now. Uh, but when the teachers found out that it was math, three-fourths of them got and walked out because they were elementary teachers and I can hear the elementary teacher that was going out that made the comment and said, well, that's why I'm an elementary teacher because I, I can't get math. You know, and I said, wow, that was my introduction to trying to go out and do presentations. Um, but then I did learn, I was more curious as to why they said that. And so I started building relationships with elementary teachers when I got back to my district to see what were their fears and actually started working with them on some of the types of math problems that they were having experiences with to build it. So I'm a firm believer out of, you, you have to have a lot of manure on different situations in order to make change, okay? The pandemic for myself, the learning experience on that was the fact that our school happened to be one-on-one -on -one before the shutdown, uh, but we still had to change our way of, of doing things and using Screencastify became my, my number one tool because students would be up at night at like two, three o'clock in the morning because that's when they were working during the pandemic and they'd be stuck on a math problem and they'll send me a text message you know, via Remind and I get it at eight o'clock in the morning. Then I would actually go and see what they were working on and I would write, I would actually do a personalized tutoring video for that student and send them a text message and here's the link. I mean, it was so convenient, that's what needed to be done. And so through the pandemic, I think I did somewhere like 375 videos. Well, those videos are there. They didn't go anywhere. So as we came out of the pandemic, I would have a student have the same question on the same, on a very similar problem. I would point them to the screen cast and now they go through the library and actually pull their video for the tutoring. So it's like endless on, on, on a lot of things. So uh, today my, my talk is, I'm saying the bus stops here. Uh, that's an old, phrase concerning leadership, in other words, who's responsible. And for the most part, like in our schools, the principal is the one that the bus stops here. They're ultimately responsible for everything. Uh, they get blamed for things, even the things that they don't want, okay? <laughs> and and uh, smart principals have realized that you have some teachers that you definitely want to have on your side because we can lay landmines, you know, for you to fall <laughs> into, okay? But, uh, Sometimes intentionally, sometimes not intentionally. It's just the way, way it works. So, but this is about, uh, about CSI, and I say the bus stops here because I'm a teacher and I'm a teacher leader. And hopefully by the end of this presentation, I want to encourage really almost two things. One, if you're not the teacher leader that I'm going to describe in this, I'm actually in challenging you to become a teacher leader like I am. If you're an administrator and then you're a principal, I'm going to encourage you that if you don't have someone like me in my definition of a teacher leader, you, when you get back to your site, you want to start thinking about this because I'm going to show you the advantages of things of exactly why you need a teacher leader in this respect. So how do you get out of CSI? That's our topic and stuff for today. So our, our objectives today, we're going to go through a process, what I call the California das Dashboard Crime Scene. In other words, y'all seen? Yeah. We all know what that is. You know, okay. is, is there enough blood there? Is that evidence? We have a blood trail on the dashboard? Okay, so we're going to talk about how to properly collect the evidence. Uh, we're going to speak about determining the eligibility for comprehensive improvement and support. And also, in this respect, uh, we may have to take a look at it because where CDE starts on one ideal on accountability. So I've been teaching for 19 years. So when I first started teaching, it was this thing called nickel, you know, no child left behind, 100% proficiency. If you don't get there, then they fire the, pre they fire the, the principal. 
They fire all the administrators, fire all the teachers, go through that rehash, all that. Then we had ESSA from President Obama. That was the next one which we have. Uh, so we're going to actually talk a little bit more about that, but things don't, things don't stay the same if it's not working. Hopefully, that's our idea when we're in school, is that if something's not working, don't keep doing something again over and over again and get those same results. That's what I call stupid, okay? So we don't want to do that. So we're going to actually look at about how to design a plan to get out of CSI. I'm going to show you, share with you our experience of what we did the whole thing, both positive and also negative, how to implement and also monitor the progress and some of the protocols and also solutions. Now I have a link on there, don't worry about it, I'm going to share it with you at the end so that you can actually get so a copy of this presentation because since I had it last night and I made it with that, I had changes that I did this morning. Okay, so I, I will have means for you to, to be able to get access to it, okay, at the end, okay. So how do you get out of CSI? How do you get out of CSI? Well, here's the key. Develop a teacher leaders. Uh, every school in here goes through what we call WAS accreditation, right? So it, that is a process. That's a process. We have a teacher that's a WAS coordinator. We send that teacher to training to be a WAS coordinator. They, they go to that training that shows them how to do a report we actually experience and go through that process of self-reflecting, focusing on students' learning, et cetera. Um, so those are all the things we do, and that's something because it's, it's a successful model that works. And if you really want to be good on WAS, then what you got to do is that you need to have your teacher, that WAS coordinator, go out on WAS visits, okay? Right now is requirement. If you have a six-year accreditation, you should be having people go out, okay? So at our school, we have two WASC coordinators. My school site actually has three schools. I actually go out on three WASC every single year. My principal sends me out. I am a WASC, so I started out as a visiting committee member. Now I'm a chairperson. And so as I said, so where do I go primarily? CCEA. So I'm a continuation WASC chairperson that goes out makes sense to have somebody come in your door that is familiar with you. We had a bad experience years ago that we had a, had a principal to come from a traditional school that did not know anything about continuation school. And when he walked through, he was saying, oh, heck no. We got to change this. And that's exactly what his attitude was. And that's not the correct way for Watts. It's not my position to come to your site and tell you what to do. You know what you're doing. You're the professionals at your site. I'm here to just to double check to make sure that what you're saying you're doing, that you're actually doing, and then offer other support and access to you and also resources. Okay, so that's how the wash should be done. So if it wasn't for us to volunteer to be eligible, then you don't have people like me coming through the door. So if, if you're not have you never been as a visiting committee member? I highly recommend that you do that. And as principals, yes, as the, the many, the more that you have. So I'm going to share with you a little bit about our evidence so I can uh, give you supporting evidence that I'm here to share with you that I know what I'm talking about because I've been through and lived through. Okay. So this is an example when in the be very beginning of August, our school principal sent to us uh, this report. And he said, good news, we're out of CSI. We have been in there ever since 2019. And for most of us, when we looked at it, especially for math and language arts, we have been in red, that sea of blood, and we saw no way out of it. And especially myself as a math teacher, I had 11th graders that come to me, and they still keep come to, coming to me, that have, they're missing 25 credits in math. And if I start them up, because math is a foundational subject, if I start them out, I have to start them out on the math one concepts, but if I do that, they never see the content that's for the test. And that's exactly where we at. And year after year after year, what happened was that we were in the sea of red. And everybody else was thinking, well, that's just how it is, that's okay. We get money, that was a positive thing. <laughs> yeah, but not everybody knew there was money. See, because I had been doing my research concerning that, and I was the one that went to my principal 
because I went to a trading and I found out about the CSI money, I go back to see him. I said, how much money did we get? And he says, oh, you, you know about that. Yeah, well, how much money is there? I think in the case it was the first check was like $55,000. $55, okay, so I always know where the money is. I always know. So, but he showed us this and he says we're out and he says the reason that we're out and in this case, he was pointing to here, but the little yes there was that we moved and increased our suspension rate by plus one. Point one, matter of fact, was point one in, in improvement. Uh, but also notice, you see here for the ELA and math scores, see that change? Plus 36, plus 33, those are huge gains, okay? And th there were reasons why those gains went on. And part of it was having a teacher leader that's responsible for CSI. I took it on myself to become that teacher leader. I wanted us out. Everybody said it couldn't be done. You tell me something can't be done, and I am the person that wants to try to get. Same thing when I have a student walk in my door and he says, I hate math. I've never been successful in math. That student has a target. I'm going to try everything in the world to turn that light on for that student. Okay. So we're going to come back to that picture because at first you look at it, it's just the data. You don't understand the significance of it. We're going to come back to it and you're going to understand. So in this case, this is actually, uh, the, there is a link which will be inside the presentation that this link, and you may have seen it. Have anybody seen this? Okay. So it, it, it's a link that provides every school in the whole state, all their status. In this case, we're talking about every, stu every student to CDAC. Uh, assistance to their status. Now this is our school district. I want you to note that you see that there are three schools on there that have no status, which means they're not in CSI and they're not in what they call ATSI. That no status is where you want to be, Utopia. There are three schools in our district. Yes, so this is Mountain View High School, my school, continuation school. This is Mountain Heights Academy, our independent study program school, which is also a six-year accredited. Matter of fact, Mountain View is a six-year accredited school with a no visit. We don't have a mid-cycle. How do we get there? Because you get two WASC coordinators that go out and we go out to schools and when we see something that's better than ours, we come back and incorporate it and we go to training. We are living, breathing CSI experts. Okay, and also for us was. The other school in our district that has no status is Santa Central Leadership Academy, which is our magnet school. Wait a minute, you got two continuation schools and alternative schools have no status and the magnet. What are they doing? I think you would probably want to say, what are you doing? What are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> what are you doing? So these are our schools. We have, we have three schools. My principal is only one principal. has three schools, the continuation, the independent study program, Mountain Heights, and we also have an adult ed. So we run all three schools. This is our graduation rates, 95.8, 99.1. Those are our graduation rates. We're a model school, PBIS plat uh, Platinum. I said the WASP is a six-year no visit. We're a green ribbon. And this year we had three teachers of the year. One of our site teachers is the district teacher of the year. We also have a region teacher of the year, which is actually Ms. Karen Lee. You probably saw her at the registration. And we also have a national uh, teacher of the year, which I can't tell you what it is, but it happens to be me. And you'll hear about it May 9th, but I can't tell you anything about it until that time point, though. So I'll let you know. Okay. And that's important because that is going to have a direct impact on here because I'm not retiring anytime soon. I have another vision and, and mission about doing things. And there's things that I'm doing at that school that is going to open up doors. If you're doing things right, you don't have a problem about money. Money starts to come to you when you're doing things right. So crime scene investigator, I mean, I, I, I used to love that show. My matter of fact, I still do. CSI, I love it. Uh, a crime scene investigator, what does he do? He examines all the all the evidence. He takes a forensic, he takes a closer look. Those CSI agents are actually serious people. They believe in their job. They believe they have a purpose for what they're doing. 
But in California, we also have CSI, but it's, it's actually called Comprehensive School Improvement. So we're going to speak about that so that you understand a little bit more. It's because of the ESSA Act that we have CSI. And we have local education agencies which are supposed to develop criteria to help. But there's one key word that I put in red, and it says stakeholders. Now, who are the stakeholders in our schools? Students. Ah, yeah. See, now you, you started right off on the right one right now. OK. We normally, when you're looking at, I mean, if you look at who's working on it, typically in a school that's in CSI, you have the principal. You may have a district administrator, which is actually looking because of accountability. And then you may have some, some teachers that get involved because you want to have teacher input. But that's there. That's where it stops, officially. We can talk about equity all we want, OK? But how about equity in action? Well, you better be able to show me some data to support that. Uh, so stakeholders is key. Guess what? We need the students and their students' voice to motivate those students in order to do well on the test. OK? If you don't have the students locked in, you're never going to get out of CSI. The other thing, it does help when the parents are involved because the parents believe that it's important for their child to do well on that test because it's for their future, not because I want you to get a, a good score on that test, but because it's for the future of your child, you have to sell that to that parent, then guess what? You won't have a problem. The other uh, item that we had concerning our graduation, but that helped us get out of CSI, is that our participation rate was 98%. 98%. That's going to come out, and you understand why that's so important. So. Has a crime been committed? Here, here we go, school eligibility. How do we know that we're going to be in CSI? Now, most of us, and I'll just say for myself, in my first 19 years, when we used to have STAR and the accountability test, I would have my students take the test. They would get their scores. The scores would go in the database. When we come back, they would tell us that we did good or we did bad, and then that was it. Then I was off to my classroom. There was no specific an, uh, analyst of the data and everything else of why they did not score proficient and what areas we need to improve on. That wasn't being done. It wasn't because we were too busy doing other things. OK. So here are the criteria right now. And I want you to note here that this is 2018, the graduation rate. So if you're below 67%, you're going to go in CSI. Uh, what happened here in 2019? They changed it to 68%. Anybody want to take a bet on your paycheck of where that probably is going to go in the future? It's probably going to go up, right? Yeah, they're, they're inching us up. And I, I, I thoroughly agree with that because in our school district, our schools are the ones that protect the graduation rate in our district. That's our job. My job is to, bring, is to get that student to graduate on time. That's my number one priority. My number, one, my number two priority is that any student that comes in my door that says they hate math, when they leave it, they will not hate math. And they will be better in math than they've ever been in their life. I know that my students, when they leave and graduate, they are prepared for the rigors of college. I don't have time to reteach them seven years of math. I just need to restore their mindset and their confidence and they will be able to accomplish anything that they want to, to do. Because whatever we want to accomplish, we can do. We can do that. So the next one is the catch me all. <laughs> Not less than the lowest performing 5% of Title I schools. I looked at that and I said, what? <laughs> what? Oh, OK, so let's look at it again. So if you're in CSI, when you finally go to the dashboard, whatever form of the dashboard there, it says, if you're all red, oh boy, you're deaf then. You're bleeding. So you definitely got to be in CSI. You need, you, you need help, OK, if you get five all the way across, OK? But it then says, schools with all red but one. OK, so you can have one. Then it says, schools with all red and orange. But then this one, it says, schools with five or more indicators where the majority are red. So you have to understand basic math in order to answer this question. So if I have five categories, I need a majority, which means I need to have how many in red? Three. That's a majority. Just a simple majority will get you there. OK, so let's take a look at here. Question is, is this school is in CSI? 
And if they are in CSI, why are they? Right, so they have three. They have a total of five, and they have three, which has majority, correct? So it wasn't their graduation rate in this case. It was actually the low, the low performing. Okay, so now I'm going to take you back to our screen that it did in the very beginning. Now, my principal, when he actually did this, he makes me believe that, you see where that yes is in green? He says that that is what got us out of CSI. Is he correct? Technically, or what? Yeah. Yeah. This is medium. OK, so that's the new naming convention that's now on the dashboard. The one I just showed you there with those arrows, that has gone away. They changed it. Unfortunately, when they changed it, it also meant something else. They started over and gave a new baseline, OK? So in a lot of cases, that should be good, because if you're currently in CSI, and the, the truth is the 11 graders that we have now, those 11 graders that taken a state test are the same 11 graders that came into school in the beginning of the pandemic, their first two years. Those are the students that had the, had the critical learning losses, and especially in math. Okay, so on the good side, if you know that information, it says, okay, these kids are going and making sure you get as many that you have in there that you can, but your score that you're getting is your base score. So now you have a new target of how you're going to get out of CSI because they changed the system. So this yeah. year is the new baseline? Yes, yes. Well, and I'm those 20 people that were in CSI schools next year will be back to the is that what they did on that one? Okay. Yeah, so it was status only this year, and that's why they said like moderate or they had different levels. L yeah, very low. Okay. Next year they're gonna go back. That's good. So that is good. It's easier to understand the little the little dial there. Okay. So going back over here, it wasn't necessarily just that point one. The real reason is here we have five areas. We have five areas and we only have two reds. So that movement moved that to yellow. So that's why we got out of CSI. But more importantly, just CSI, we also got out of ATSI. Yes? Are you saying that the juniors that take the test, if they just vomit, that's your baseline? So then obviously you could improve the next group? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. So. Okay, so if you look at the chart, now go back at the chart, in order to move from red up into yellow, there is a large gap. So the answer to that question, I'm gonna say no, you don't want them to completely bomb it because if all your scores are down at the bottom, in order for you to move out of red up to yellow, you're gonna have a lot more points to go. Okay, so you do want your kids to, to do as best, but I'm just saying what everything is saying right now is that these students are the lowest performing, so their scores are going to go there, so your new baseline is probably going to be different. Yes. Okay, so yes, I do not want them to bomb it. Okay. Well, not that you're encouraging yeah. them, but if yeah. coming out of the pandemic. Right. So there is one thing that you do want to check on, uh, on here. So your participation rate, your participation rate can directly impact you moving. And the reason is, if Johnny comes in to take the test, and Johnny doesn't finish the test, there is a problem, okay? I became involved with the CSI and started looking at these numbers about four years ago, and what I finally did in that year, I actually looked at the data, looked at all the scores, and as I was going down the scores, I saw 10 kids that had the exact same score. And I'm saying, well, how do they have the exact same score? I'm saying, well, are, are they cheating? No, their scores are low. So I said, well, no, they, they, they <laughs> <laughs> if, if they did, they chose the wrong one. <laughs> chose the wrong one. I said, but th th there's got to be a reason. So I started looking at it, and it turned out that each one of these students started to take it but didn't finish it. So if a student starts to take it but does not complete the test, it automatically gives you the lowest score, which on the last scale is roughly 2280. 
You need 2553 in order to be proficient, which means that they automatically go down 263 points. Let me bring it into another point, 263 points, that student, 10 students, that's 2,630 points. If I had 100 students taking the test, that meant it dropped my score by 26.3 points off of every student. Oh, rule number one, everybody takes that test. Everybody finishes that test. That will give you a net gain of roughly about 26 points. Okay, that's a critical thing. Yes. Is it better if you have students not taking it than starting it and not finishing it? Is there any critical? No. Okay. Well, they catch you because they want you to have ninety-five percent. You need to have ninety-five percent participation, and the higher you get over that, you know, that participation, the better you're going to be. Yeah. So they so they get you on that. So yes. <coughs> No, it's okay. So in a situation where you have a high set program and those students are on your school roll and they are not taking the science, because this, this is where I see the, the issue, mm -hmm. because they're not junior, so they're not 18 and they can't take it, the high set program, but you have a senior that didn't take the science. So you're trying to want them to take this on because they're on a high set program. Because they're seniors and didn't take it, is that still going to affect this year's score? You understand know what I'm saying? No. Right now, all the seniors are taking it unless they take it. Like our high school, our traditional high school, we force our 11th graders to actually take that science test so they get rid of it. And I, we have seniors which come in that, that are taking it. I don't know what they're doing with the data right now, but right now it's not on the dashboard doesn't mean it's not going to be in, in the future. Anybody know, you know, I haven't seen anything else as of yet. So, okay. Okay, so, if CSI wasn't enough, <laughs> now they came out with ATSI. Now, what is ATSI? Oh, remember that for years they've been talking about the achievement gaps? Okay. So they've been saying it and it's on there, but now what they have is ATSI says, so now for any of these subgroups, if you have subgroups which are in the same category as we did before with the reds and everything, now you're an ATSI. So you have to be looking at your subgroups. That's why I'm saying you need a CSI teacher leader. Someone's looking at the numbers and the data because typically we're not looking at that. I, I know we weren't, okay? We are now is because we, we have a team that's actually looking at those numbers. You have to because right now, the only way that you're going to get out is that you need to know who these students are and where they're at. And that's the ATSI. So the, in this case, we get homeless students. We, we have those. We got English learners. We got foster students, students with disability, socioeconomic disadvantaged students. Yeah, all those areas. Another way for you can get into a category for improvement. Okay, so most of the principals I know don't, don't like this because we, get a, we have a sour taste of thinking about like from, from Nickelback and everything else. Is it affecting my performance? If I'm still in the red, do you think districts are going to try to find somebody else to replace you after a while? I don't know. Okay, so we're not going to go to it, but uh, inside the presentation, is everybody familiar with the California dashboard? Okay, so what I want you to do, when you leave here today and everything, I need you to go to that dashboard and look for your school and so that you know where you're at. Okay, you need to know, you need to feel and see and examine that scene and see where you're at, okay? And if you're responsible as a teacher in a responsible area, you need to start taking personal, personal responsibility for the fact that you have kids which are in different areas. And so if they're in red in language arts, why are they in red? What are the things that we're doing wrong? How can we make the kids? You have to believe that those kids can get out. Okay. So this is the new one, and I'm glad, thank you for pointing it out. Good, so this is just a temporary, this is what you're seeing now, but it's virtually the same thing. So now I'm gonna look here in this school right now, so here's a good point. So I'm looking at this school here right now, 
And as I'm looking at this, will this school, if it stays the same, are they gonna be in CSI coming up next year when the new dial come in? Yeah, why, because they have what? They have three and five, yeah. So now, here's the other catchy, okay. When I looked at it, I said, well, five or more, okay, and the majority, uh, can you be working on something and all of a sudden get you in the CSI because you're working in something in the area? Notice this, college and career. Ooh, wait a minute. We've been working on college and career. Why is it blank? There was no cohort data for this year, so they didn't report it. Yes. Now, they're actively working on trying to improve their college and career readiness. Unless they get a game plan, when they start popping up and then they do have sufficient numbers, then all of a sudden they're going to inject themselves with another low score. Yes. Ah. I don't have certified CTE pathway color. And I have strong, strong feels about equity, especially in that category of continuation. Okay. So I agree with you on that. Okay. Uh, currently, in 2019 and everything else, right, there was no AP classes uh, at our school now. Last year, I had three students take AP computer science principles. And one student actually, uh, I had all three that took the state tests. I mean, this took the AP, I have one that passed. That concept proved that I can have a continuation student take an AP course. For my math students, I dual enrolled them into a computer science principle when they came in my class. And the reason I did that, back in 1972, I got nominated and attended the United States Naval Academy. And when I went there, they made it mandatory that I take two years of computer science, basic programming. Computers didn't exist as far as I knew. I just had this teletype. There were no calculators back then. Why in the heck did they have me take computer science? Because all the Navy ships were having those computers put on there. So I needed to understand computer science and everything. I'm glad they did because my knowledge on computers has supported me for all the years. I've always been ahead of all my peers. So I am embedding in our math classes computer science and we also have AP. So that same student that passed the computer science principles started and he's been taking computer science A, Java programming, and he's taking the, uh, the, state, the, the AP test this Wednesday. I'm doing it for a proof of concept. Okay, guess what, I, our kids can do it. This summer, my principal in the district has given me uh, 60 hours to develop a, uh, the curriculum for the AP, which is gonna be for an online, because I need to tap into our independent study uh, uh, students to work on it. That will be accessible. The doctor will be looking for any student applications. I don't care if you're not in my district to prove the concept, and I will provide access to those computer science programs to any student which is in the CCEA. Okay, so those things, yes, we do need to. So I, those are things I'm working on. You see, I'm motivated about this area and giving kids opportunity and stuff. But that's why I'm here with CCEA because this is what we need. It, if it affects my school, it affects everybody's school. So if my school can give students opportunity, there's no reason why you can't. Okay, yes. Yes, okay, so the lesson learns on that. You have to not assume that the traditional high school has the computer science course. Typically, if the traditional high school has a course, we can easily piggyback up on that and actually just swap it over as a piece of cake. If not, we have to go through that course approval. So when I went out and got the training for it, I came back and told my principal, I lost my mind, I wanna have some kids do this computer science principal. He says, if it's approved, we looked, the high school had it, but they didn't have anybody teaching. I became the first, a continuation teacher became the first teacher teaching AP computer science principles in our district. Oh, so since I did it, they didn't want to be showing up, so guess what? Now the high school has it. Okay. 
Now the high school had it, has it. Well, since I had already had that success of the three kids and one of them passed it, well, I'm saying, hey, I want to keep going. So what I did was go ahead and start to get the training and certification for the next course, Computer Science A. I assumed that the high school had it in. No, they didn't. And then when I found out, I provided everything to my principal, my counselor, to go ahead and submit it. And I started doing what I normally do. But it turned out that they didn't do what they were supposed to do, and they dropped the ball. In the meantime, I have a student that's been taking that computer science A. Oh, revelation. Guess what? Johnny can take the computer science A, AP course, even though you don't have it, because Johnny can still take the test. Oh. He can still take the test. Also, I understand because if I'm their teacher of record, when, that's, when Johnny comes back and now the approval has gone in, I have him as a teacher of record, I can still give him his credit. Okay. Research has recently come out concerning AP, and this is important. They say that students that even get a two or a one on the AP, colleges are actually considering the applications because they have been proven. Uh, the research says that these students do much better even though they didn't get the college credit because they took the course, they were working with the rigors, A2 says they are ready for college. So yes, we need to get our kids to take in these AP courses. So this is our region. And in the course, we're not gonna do it but based on, oh no, we're almost there. Okay, but, but we're gonna do it later. But inside here, when you start to go look at your dashboard, you're looking at all these areas. This is what you want. You need to know exactly where you're at, okay? That's where you need to do, okay? Uh, that right there is a link where it's just collecting the information, okay? So if you want to do that later, that will help me with research data and everything else. If you can take that and afterwards go there to the dashboard and actually put your information in. Okay. As a teacher leader, I always, always report a problem only after conducting research to provide a solution. I never, go to my, I never go to my principal and say, this is messed up, but this is messed up, unless I've also researched and come up with a, with a solution. And you, typically, he sits in. <laughs> Ken, he, he's, he's a great guy. <laughs> he sat in, I said, well, I found out that this, this, this is wrong. And I did my research. And so I get option one, option two, and option three, and I think that option two is the best for us. And, and Ken just sits down, he thinks a little bit, and he says, okay. And I just go out the door. I say, oh, well, wait a minute, I, I need $5,000. He says, okay, talk to Monica. You know, <laughs> so that's because I've been doing it for a while. But Okay, so here's the thing. We don't, we don't want to be blind. We have to be proactive. Every school needs a CSI teacher leader. Someone is designated that they believe in it, and as administrators, you need to spend your money on that teacher leader. You do that by uh, other things you can do, so spending dollars on them, uh, micro appreciation, little things that you can do that, that tells them that they're doing a good job to keep them motivated. And I'm also going to say, use this organization. This association is the platform to do that. Recognize people. Put them in for the awards and stuff. That's what this organization is. And I'll just say, for instance, Valley High School. I swear, I've been coming here seven years, okay? And every year, I'm here in Valley High School. They're on the essays. They're on exemplary programs. I, this time, I was able to go to their school. Valley is focused. And I think last night, I think they probably had two tables, okay? So use our organization here as a platform for as motivating your teachers. Okay, uh, it will go a long way. And also for leadership, my advice is let them run. I'm the type of person, if you give me a problem, I'm going to solve it. And every school site, I believe, have individuals like me that you can give them a problem and they will just go. Okay? And they just need to check in with you and say, hey, I'm doing this, this, and this, and just let them go. If you got someone like that, just let them go. That's what you want to do. Now, this is how we started out. When they found out we were in CSI, this is the roadmap that went. First roadmap is that our COE, our county, came in and said, oh, you're in CSI, so now we got to give you professional development. They said, your process is that you're going to do a guiding coalition so you can develop steps and develop an action plan. Then we're going to teach you how to be improvement scientists. 
And we had to go to these meetings on improvement scientists to learn how to improve our school. And I was sitting there and listening to this stuff. I said, well, while you're talking, I, I, I got work to do, okay? So turned out that here, here's the bottom line. All of this, I don't care what you use in your district, how you identify your plan, but you're going to need teachers that's going to actually pilot it and implement any of the solutions. If what you're currently having is not getting you there, you need to start looking at other things. We actually go out to different uh, professional develops, and, and our district sends us out because we stay abreast of all the different changes. Now, we're doing this because of math, but you know what? Matter of fact, I'm thinking back here in the last 19 years, I don't remember my counterparts in English and language arts putting in submissions for conferences to go about language arts. So my thing here is that language arts teachers need to find out what organizations they are and schools need this, we need to start sending them there to these places because the problems that we have is not isolated just here for the state of California. Teacher leaders, WASP and model schools, those are the two plat platforms that we use. We go out between me and Karen, Karen Lee's in the back, so she's my other teacher leader. Uh, we go out six times, I'm sorry. We go out and do six model schools, and we go out and do six WASPs together. We're seeing 12 schools every year we go out and look and see what they're doing and steal those ideals that are better than ours and bring them back into our community. So. This is what happened when we first got in CSI and when they started doing all this, this is what they came up with us to do. They said, oh, we're going to start doing CTE because we're going to boost the, that college and career readiness. And they said, oh, so we don't have any, so we went out and paid money to get these CTE segments. They all look good because they looked at areas and stuff that kids sh should be interested in. Now, I note that. Teachers and administrators chose the courses because they think that the kids should be interested. <laughs> yeah, big problem, right? Wouldn't it have been better to say, kids, what would you be interested in, in attending? I mean, what do you want to do in the future? Something that they're going to be motivated to do. Okay, so if you're thinking about that path, you need to make sure that you check with your kids. <laughs> and also check in your community and see if there's any viable pathways that when they do do the course, they can go out to the job. And I'll add on to that. Not yeah. only ask your kids, but once they give the feedback, follow through with what they've asked, because I've been in the district where they asked the kids, and then they didn't follow through. And then the kids were like, well, then why'd they even ask our opinion? <laughs> Student voice, we've heard that. So while they did that, I was over here in left field. I decided that I wanted to do something with engagement because I did speak with my students. I found out that we had had uh, one of the teachers that started doing robotics and started doing esports. And I saw what was happening to those kids and their eyes was lighting up. So I said, I need a little bit of taste of that. And so that's why we started doing the uh, computer science courses. Uh, it's all about student engagement and motivation. We do math fun day because it helps build relationships with our kids. It's all these things about motivation. So these solutions, we, we use for e each one of our kids that come in, this is our process of how I diagnose and understand where our students are at. We use the exact path diagnostics that's district wide. I look at their scores, and if their scores are low, then I make a determination of where they go. If their scores are high, then we put them in, uh, and they say they're going to college, then they're in their A through G curriculum, and we put them in the mentum, and that's where they go, and we have their support. If, on the other hand, if they're, they're, they're low and they're, their goals are saying, no, I'm not going that path, then we open up and do different things. Our orientation process for us in math is making sure that they have math study skills and mindset. No, I'm not doing it with an orientation program. Every student that comes in, it's not as elaborate as like Valley has for the nine-week program, but I do have an orientation. That, that actually helps them. Mindset. I give my students a mindset inventory. If they fail my mindset initial quiz, then I send them to YouTube and have them take the Jane Bowler, I mean the, the Joe Bowler course for mindset. Because I know if their mind's not right, there's no way I can teach them math. I also do our code when that comes up, which is normally around December. I do that every year, and the reason is because this engagement is a break, and the kids do the hour of code because it motivates them, and it's perfect time for me and them right before Christmas. Math Fun Day is when we bring an entire elementary school over and we set up our gym with math games that are out throughout the whole year. 
uh, and we, we bring them. We have 500 kids that come over to our school to teach them how to have math. I do it for their kids, but I do it for my kids. It motivates them. They see themselves and the other kids, okay? And it, they totally change their attitudes when they come back into class because now they taught this third or fourth grade kid how to do a problem that they couldn't understand. And now they come in my classroom and now they, they decide, oh, well, wait a minute, maybe I do need to talk to the teacher so he can help me. It's just tremendous. I've been doing it for seven years. Grade level, I, I, I'm, I'm looking at the reading because if they don't have a high enough reading, if I have an online program and stuff, they're not going to be successful if they're reading score. Now, here I'm going to talk about this one because this is my last golden egg. Not right now. So these 11 graders that I got that actually went through the pandemic, these same kids had very difficult situations. The bottom line, when I tested them, they're all third, fourth grade level. Okay, so when what I had using, I was using the learning path, but their, their reading scores are low. It was not working and they were not being successful. So around December time frame, I had virtually, I had about 75 kids on, on my rollout of my classes and about 72 of them were, 72 were not working, not progressing the way I wanted them to be able to do. And so I had students with disability. So I had seen this program when my, my school had sent me out to NCSM. I saw it, I'd been looking at it, I had a demo in it, I didn't have time to go and implement it. So I, I saw this and I had this one student that they wanted him to graduate, he had an IEP. And so I got together with a resource and I said, well, let's see if we can put him on this and let's see what he does. This student got on that program and something changed. He was not successful in the other programs. But when he got on this, he started working. Not only was he working, was that the way I could tell when I have a student, when that student who's been sitting in his desk had not asked me a single question, he's very polite. Matter of fact, you go into my math class today with my subs, they love it. It's like you can hear a pen drop. My students come in, get their computers, go to their desk, open them up, go ahead and work, just like clockwork, five minutes before the bell, the computers go down, they get up, they put the computers in, the bell rings and they're out, and that's all four periods. What, what he started doing was coming and asking me questions. How can I do this? I said, why? I said, what lesson are you on? I said, then I, I think he told me, I'm on lesson 26. I went, Wait a minute, you did 26 lessons? I said, why? He says, well, I was having fun. So <laughs> I think I was earning credits. So I started doing it, and long story short is that from December to March, Slowly, every student that was not working, all those students went on to this program called Let's Go Learn. Okay, so I have some reports here, but I'm not gonna show all those because I'm actually preparing another, probably like a webinar to kind of go over all my, my things. But what I do wanna share with you is my student voices. These are letters from uh, my st uh, students that were on the program, and this is what they said, okay. so. The student said, let's go learn is also good. They were actually comparing all the programs they were doing. I needed to get feedback of to, is this program working for you? If it's not working, guess what? Ask the kids, they'll tell you. So this kid says, let's go learn on the other hand. He, he said, so he had two. He said, the one program that's my favorite, he says, let's go learn. He said, let's go learn on the other hand is my favorite because it tells you what you got wrong and then it gives you the way to solve it. Let's Go Learn also is good because it gives you a reason to keep on getting higher scores because there are badges for percentages you get. For example, if you get 75%, you have to start over. If you get between 75 and 85%, you get a bronze. Then you get between 85 and 90, and I get a silver medal. And then if I get over 95%, I get a gold medal. He says the deal breaker for me that makes Let's Go Learn better is that I'm able to work at it at my own pace. If I fail an assignment, I just redo it right away. Uh, but he says on the other program, if I fail it, I have to notify the teacher to unlock the assignment. And if that happens on the weekend, I'm just out of luck. He says being able to do your assignment right away is important because if you're at home and you fail an assignment, you have to email your teacher and sometimes that takes a very long time. Is the other program Apex? Hmm? Is the other Program. He's comparing this to Apex? Uh, a program similar to Apex. That, that was not Apex. Apex. I just left it out to the order to protect the guilty. <laughs> <laughs> if you ask me afterwards, then I will. <laughs> okay. okay. 
That's also because I'm on camera, so I'm going to make it sure. So this other student says, and this student here, he graduated. He sat in my class. He was an African-American student. He was not progressing whatsoever. He said, now, Let's Go Learn is different because it's not boring, but it's fun, entertaining, and you get to do more done in less time. He said, I, I, I would say an average person should be able to complete up to three lessons or more in one hour. OK, three lessons or more in one hour. This kid sat in my class, and I couldn't do, have him do one lesson in four months, and he said the lessons. Ideally, what the lessons are different. Typically in math, you're teaching a whole unit, and then the student is assessed over all those items and units. Okay? In this case, with the Let's Go Learn, because it is an adaptive, when the student takes the assessment, it knows where the student is, and then what it gives them assignments based on where they're at, wherever they're at. But when it does the lessons, it gives you a lesson, but the lesson is, is, is animated, it has colors, uh, it speaks to them. And so what it is, it's engaging to, to the kid, and it's short and sweet. So it gives a lesson for 10 minutes, and it tests them only on those topics for that 10 minutes. That's what they like. It's like chunked automatically, and that's why they like. He says, I, I, he says, when it came to this other course, I really didn't like math, but what changed when I started to do Let's Go Learn, I'm pretty sure I can speak for everyone else for the last one. He says, Any, another thing I love about Let's Go Learn is it doesn't offer is that it will read it out loud to you. And there's a video that will play and will help you get a better understanding. The other thing he said was this, talking about the other program. He says, when I, take a pro when I take a test in that program, it's asking me 50 to 60 questions. And I'll say, after you answer 15 to 20, that's when people get zoned out. This last one is a young lady. Uh, she sat in my class for a year and a half and did not do anything. And she says, all the, she's the one who said, I hate math. She says, let's go learn is simple and easy, which makes learning easier for me because I've always struggled with the topic and not understanding the curriculum or examples being given. It made the lessons quicker and easier when given a prime example on how the math should be done and the easiest way to do it. Personally, I prefer let's go learn over the other one any day just because the difference between it is so dramatic and it totally made it easier. The bottom line is this. This program works for my students, okay? You may have a program. The question is, is the program working? If it's working, then fine. If it is not working, then guess what? Let's not be stupid and do the same thing over and over again. Find something else that does. That means you're going to have to get out of your classroom, and you're going to have to go and join the associations, whether it was here. Now, myself and Karen, we come here every year because every year we've been looking, and any time we find something that works, I come here and I share it. Okay, because if it's working for my students, in this case, my students have the same baggage coming in my classroom like yours. So if my kids are getting engaged, the only thing I know on my reports here, I have students that are gaining two grade levels in their fundamental math, and I can do it in less than 60 days. Less than 60 days, I can take any kid and come through and sit down. I have a process that I go with that kid. And part of that process is that we, we actually learn together. Let's see if I can get down here as we go, because I get started. So engagement plus motivation plus relationships is everything. My kids will do anything. They will do anything, because they know that when I give them assignment, they're going to have to demonstrate to me that they know that topic, and I will reward them, because my class is set up on a signature system. Every credit, you have to demonstrate six to eight things. If you, uh, if you demonstrate those, you get a signature. My kids would do anything for signature. The reason my subs love to come in my classroom, because when I leave my class, I have a good behavior rule. The good behavior rule says that for every day the doc is gone, you get a good behavior signature, as long as you can prove that you did work, and as long as you have been respectful to my sub. In the last four years, I've never had a letter from a sub. Matter of fact, I have no problems about having the subs because my kids. I'm gone 25 days out of the school year, but yet my students are still producing because they have something that's engaging. I motivate them, and I have a solid relationship with them, and that's why my kids will do anything because they know I got their back. I care about them. If a program is not working for them, I'll find another, and we have multiple programs. We have to have a buffet for our kids. Yes. Uh, one, do you do uh, partial credits? So, like, my, my school is five credits or nothing. So that's my first question. Yeah. And then my second question is: Is 
that how you then teach math in your class by using this program? You don't have a direct instruction or a let's go through this packet or whatever your instruction is? Okay, so no, I do not have packets. Yes, we do have partial credits. The high school sends students to us that are, may have matching credits, two or three, and yes, we do do that, a partial on that. I only post grades five credits at a time. So they may come with two and a half, I give them work to get the two and a half, then I post the five, the five credits. Did that answer your, your question? Did I get everything? Is this your mo uh, mode of instruction? Okay, so my mode of instruction, yes, because in our school, students come any time throughout the year. I'm not on the quarter basis, no. I have students coming in every time during the year. So my orientation is, is automated with a checklist that they have to go through and it's hooked up in Google Classroom. So the first thing, that when my students come in, I have a process. The first thing, when they come in, the first thing they have to do is that they have to have taken that diagnostic because I'd use that data. That helps me to determine what I'm gonna put them in. Second thing, they have to do my orientation because I gotta check their mindset before I give them any curriculum. Then, based on their level, I make a decision. If the, if the kid is at 11, 1200 and he's, he's good on the grade level, then he goes in the, and he's going to college, he goes through the AG, A through G, and I use either the Alex, I use Edgenuity, I've done Pearson, I've done Edmentum, whatever the flavor is that the district says I use. Okay, if a student is struggling, their skills are low, I know they're not gonna be successful. Then what I do for Let's Go Learn, I have them do their diagnostics. That diagnostics confirms the exact path. Based on that score, then I decide whether I put them in the pre-algebra to make up pre-algebra skills, or I put them in the algebra. And the kids are working independently. Each one is at different levels. I have 16 sections of math in every period of class I have. Yes? Yes. Primarily, I do two ways. One, if the kid is going to college and I can't do it because I have to have an A through G course code, so that student stays in that. If I have a student who's not going to college, he says he's not going to college, then I will change his course code to a W code, okay? So, but he still gets his five credits where he can use and graduate. The other thing is I also look at elective credit. Primarily, if they have, if they have a lot of elective credit, my first choice, on, on, on giving them electives on the let's go learn, I use elective because they're building up something. I much rather save the math, I save the math credits and I want each one of my students to have credits that are an A through G course in at least algebra and, or the math one course, okay. Okay, so here are the things I do for the aspect. Okay, so if I have the kids going and working on this pass, how do I get them prepared for the aspect? Well, my school does a couple things. One, I get all the 11th graders. So my, 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 we, we came with, it's, it's my fault, I opened my mouth. I said, well, maybe it would work better if we have all the 11th graders in one spot, because what happened, then I do a hybrid. So I would actually do warm-ups for this day in history that actually teaches them how to use, um, how to get over their fear of word problems. Then I take the SBAC curriculum, SBAC construct vocabulary using Freer models where they work on the vocabulary that's on the test. If a student understands the language of math, their scores are gonna go up. Um, and then they also work on their individual work. So it's like a, a hybrid in there. And again, in my class, students earn credits by my signature. So whatever they're doing, let's go learn, or we're doing these warm-ups, whatever, as long as they get the five, that's how they get their credits. And again, it said we have the AP course. Okay, these are resources, but you have that on there. And I guess we've already kind of explained to that. Um, yes, question, yes. Um, so how many, like, how many um, lessons do you expect a student to do in Let's Go Math while they're, in, like, for a credit? Five. Five. Five yeah. lessons? Yes. They're doing five lessons. Five lessons, which they have to score over 75% or higher. Of, I do use the, the ICAs, but I use them a little bit differently. I actually use the ICA. I have all my students take the ICA so that they can become familiar with the platform that they're gonna see. But initially what I do is that I have them go through it with this concept, if you know it, just check and go on. If you don't know it, they write the number of the problem that they don't know. I mean, you just, you know, they just shut down and write those numbers. And then I collect those numbers. And then what I do, 
I base my warm-ups on the questions and topics that they're fear of and do those. So when my students go in, the other thing is I do a, uh, a, uh, I do a, um, a Desmos scavenger hunt because the calculator on the state test is uh, Desmos. And my students know that the first eight questions or the first 10 questions on the test, they don't have a calculator, but they know for the majority of the questions, three-fourths of the questions, that calculator button is up there. And my students know how to click on it. They know how to use that calculator. They know how to take an equation like the linear equation and pop it in there. So if they know the vocabulary and they know how to use that Desmos, you're going to get points in growth. Yes? Um, so for your counterparts on the English side, <laughs> um, vocabulary I get. Is there any other thought as far as resources for, I don't know, I hate to use this term, teaching the kids to the test? You mean on teach? On, on the English side, for us English teachers. <laughs> for English. Yeah, teaching the vocabulary, I guess. The main thing I do with, as far as working, trying to work with the English teachers, is that I, I, have a, uh, I have an essay project that we combine with the English department. And that essay with the English department is uh, like on mathematicians. So they pick three mathematicians, they write an essay based on what the language arts make them on their criteria, and then they take it and put it on a PowerPoint. So those are things. So we kind of run out of time. That's why I flashed it back there. I do have, so this is to the feedback. Please leave that. Here's the link to the presentation. There's my emails and contacts. If you go on there, you get my contact information. Uh, and inside that contact information, it has my website, the addresses, and stuff. There's also a, a, a link in there concerning the book review. Uh, I've decided that I started writing books, and this is my first year doing it. It's really devoted to our, our environment. And this book is called, it just, just have it out, but I'm looking for people to give me feedbacks. This is about how to teach math to students which are giving up on learning, which are our kids. Okay, so I'm giving these out free to anyone? For those? Oh, you got one yesterday? Okay, there's some more in there. And the only thing I ask for you to do is to read it. If you see some things that you think we need to add in there, please do, because I'm going to have another version coming out next year. And uh, leave me a review, because that review allows me to help other, other students. Could you pass that to her? OK. Any more here? Get some on this side over here. OK. And if you did not give one, OK, all you do is email me. On that link there, just email me 